You know, there isn't a single person in the world of podcasts, content providers and listeners alike, that doesn't know that I am the world's worst graphic designer. So, I need some help. If you're an artist, or if you know one, I need new original artwork for this podcast. So why don't you, or your friend, who's an artist if you tell them, enter my artwork contest. The winner gets their artwork featured on mattsaudioblog.com, that's M-A-T-T-S audioblog.com, and on future podcasts released starting the second half of our Game of Thrones Season 4 rewatch. And you win a free Amazon gift card worth $100. Pretty cool, huh? But naturally, there are some rules. Number one, you must submit your artwork via email to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. That's M-A-T-T-S audioblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And you must submit by midnight Pacific Daylight Time, August 18th, 2018. Rule number two. The artwork must be 2400 by 2400 pixels in size. And three, you cannot use any of the images or fonts owned by Game of Thrones or HBO. Now, if you, or the friend that you tell, is selected the winner, the Amazon card will be transmitted electronically to the email address of the submitter. Then your name, and if you have a website, your website, will be added to the show notes of each podcast it's used for. And naturally, the winner will have this artist wannabe. You will have my personal thanks, my eternal gratitude. Once again, submit your artwork to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. That's M-A-T-T-S audioblog, all one word, at gmail.com by midnight Pacific Daylight Time, August 18th, 2018. Thanks in advance for your creativity and participation, and good luck. This podcast is now available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more. Please leave a written review on whatever app you get this podcast from. Spoiler alert! When this podcast talks about Game of Thrones on HBO, it talks in the context of the most recently aired episode. And when it talks A Song of Ice and Fire books, it talks in the context of the most recently released book by George R. R. Martin. You've been warned. Dedicated to HBO's Game of Thrones and George R.R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire book series, you're listening to Matt's audio blog, Game of Thrones. And now, here's your host, Matt Murdock. Welcome back to Matt's audio blog. Game of Thrones style, or if this is your first time here, welcome to the podcast. My name is Matt Murdock. I am from mattsaudioblog.com. That's M-A-T-T-S audioblog.com. It's your one-stop shop for all things this podcast, like back episodes, contact information, our YouTube link, and other kinds of links like podcast app links. And I'd very much appreciate it if you would take the time to leave me a written review of this podcast in whatever app that you're using. That's what helps me stay more noticeable among other Game of Thrones podcasts that are out there. I'm trying to build a community here so that we have a really nice community by the time season eight finally gets here sometime next year. In the meantime, we're rewatching this series and we're up to season three, episode seven, the bear and the maiden fair written by George R. R. Martin, directed by Michelle McLaren. And if you have any thoughts about this episode or any of the season three episodes, or really any episode of Game of Thrones, since this is a rewatch podcast, you can comment on just about anything in any context. But you need to get it into me by August 25th, 2018, to make the next feedback podcast. That's your deadline, August 25th, 2018. How do you submit? You can send an email to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. That's M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com. Or you can tweet to Matt's G-O-T blog on the Twitter, M-A-T-T-S G-O-T blog on the Twitter. And any feedback that you want to submit in will be included in the next feedback podcast. That includes if you want to submit a three-word description of an episode or the best coupling of an episode. We call that Brothel Mates. 
I include that stuff in the feedback podcast as well. And more on all of that in a moment. Normally, on a Monday, we take a look at the story first, and then we analyze the music, which is what most people listen to this podcast for, is actually my analysis of the music rather than the story. So if you're into just the music, then you can skip ahead um, several minutes, fairly close to the end of the podcast. In the meantime, let's talk about Season 3, Episode 7, The Bear and the Maiden Fair, written by George R. R. Martin, directed by Michelle McLaren. I like to group my story discussion into little pigeonholed sections, and not every story fits those sections, but we start with just things that you note that are on the surface, not really so deep, and then we get into what I call three big things, which is the three things that I found in the episode that I feel like have a lasting impact on the story. And then we get into tidbits, just the extra little odds and ends that may be a little bit more important than the stuff on the surface. Sometimes it's not. Then we'll do three words where I will demonstrate to you how to describe the episode in three words. Probably not so well. You can probably do a better job. And then brothel mates, which is the best coupling of the episode, which doesn't necessarily have to be two people. It can be a person and an object or a person and a concept, those kinds of things, if you wish, as well. But we start with on the surface. And the first thing to note, of course, is that George R. R. Martin is writing this episode. And for book readers, they get excited when the author of the source material is going to pen an episode for Dave and Dan. Um, He did for the first four seasons, I believe, and then he had to start taking a break because he was getting a lot of pressure about Winds of Winter. Plus, he was writing about three or four wild card stories instead of writing Winds of Winter. So uh, George has been busy uh, doing other things. So we enjoy when the episodes do come in that George is able to write on. And the nice thing about having George in is because he does know things about these characters that he either has to relay to Dave and Dan and they decide whether they want to interpret it a certain way or not, or he may know some things that they just don't even, he hasn't even told them. Now, at the time that this episode came out, of course, A Dance of Dragons had already been out, and we already knew a little bit more about Melisandre than we had before because we finally got POV chapters from her. And Melisandre, being a slave, as she tells Gendry in this episode, um, it seems to be one of those things that jives with the book. So uh, I'm glad that George found a way to work that in so that we see that there's a duality to Melisandre, that she hasn't always just been this person who just became a priestess and this fanatic. Um, maybe there's a reason for her to have to have something to believe in. And that was really fun for me to go through and and just find out some of these little nuggets that George put in um, that were in the books but hadn't really been explained in the show before. One question you could ask about Melisandre is, how long ago was that that Melisandre was a slave? She said her mother was a slave and she was. Ah, Well, I mean, given her age that we found out in season six, that might have been a hundred years ago for all we know. Another nice little thing, and I'm glad that George got an opportunity to actually work on this part of the story, and that is Rob and Talisa finding out that they're having a baby, or Talisa telling Rob. And that's such a sweet moment, and I thought it was written very well. And uh, there's a lot of allusions in the books as to whether Talisa's book counterpart is pregnant or not. And uh, this pretty much all but confirmed it if you want to do a one-to-one kind of comparison. I'm not sure if you really want to do that because obviously uh, the character in the books and Talisa are two very separate people. And different things have happened to those two characters between books and show. So I don't want to go into the differences too much because I don't want to spoil something uh, for somebody who might be reading the books. And uh, it's just it's just lovely to have this moment, though, where George can actually write uh, this about Talisa 
And of course, it's also very sad to see them be so happy and realize what's coming up for them in just a couple of episodes. One thing that George has really put in the book, so this has been alluded to in the show, addressed directly other than Catelyn saying, you know, you had a thing with Walder Frey. And Catelyn has been a little bit short with Talissa as well. But that glaring look from Michelle Fairley just sent knives through me when she was leaving the tent and, and seeing them be all happy and everything. Um, that was scary. And um, I think that that exhibits a lot more of Catelyn's doubt and fear and suspect of Talissa's book counterpart um, than we had gotten before. And I'm not sure if that was a directing choice or if something George had put in the script, um, but it was an excellent choice. And I felt like that that really reflected um, the way George, who has written POVs for Catelyn, um, has expressed Catelyn's feelings about Rob's wedding to a woman who was other than the fray. Here's another thing that George addresses kind of head on because uh, for us Sansa fans, it's always hard to see Sansa be so downplayed by a lot of the fandom because of her naivete. And I love the idea of the girl who believes in fairy tales um, has to stop believing in them and might get a chance to make her own fairy tales someday although not nearly in the dainty way or the the pristine way um, that she had perceived the previous fairy tales and sophie turner's performance in this and, and her sadness about just being duped into what she's been duped into um, the mistake that she made regarding littlefinger i don't know how much of all of that she told marjorie but in the same respect she just is starting to see how all of these fairy tales are dying and and to watch a little girl or just imagine this watch your child not believe in santa claus anymore that's kind of in a lot of ways the same thing and it's it's hard to see and i love that george addresses it but he also doesn't let sansa off the hook just as he doesn't in the books and i think that's very important that the conversation when it turns to sex with marjorie uh it, it's quite apparent and and it tells you a lot about marjorie in the books as well is that it's quite apparent that marjorie is or at least has been sexually active and Sansa uh, just presumes that because she's not married yet, then she hasn't had sex. And uh, I, I love the fact that George kind of confronts this idea that Sansa is still quite naive, no matter how much us fans want her to grow fast, um, no matter how much the haters say she'll never grow or whatever, or they just say, just get her off the screen. She's wasting my time, which is the one thing that I cannot stand. Um, you know, George is saying, yeah, she's realizing that things are wrong. But the thing that she has to learn is that there's a whole world out there that she still has to learn about. And that's what kind of the process of, of season four becomes for Sansa. And especially season five becomes for Sansa is the fact that she has to get through and see a lot of the uglier, uglier side of the world as if she hasn't seen enough with Joffrey already. Joffrey is one of these extreme cases and King's Landing is one of these extreme cases. But when you start to see it over the course of several places, like even in her own home in Winterfell, man, that kind of stuff just starts to build on you and you see what kind of a person Sansa has become by the time you get into seasons six and seven as a result of that. And I like stronger Sansa. I wish the fairy tale wouldn't have had to die for her. But like I said, in just a couple moments ago, I hoping that Sansa is going to become a person who is able to create her own fairy tale. And it may not be as pretty and as clean as the ones that she read in the book, whatever book that she's reading, you know, with all the fairy tales in it. But at least she can find her own happiness. She can find a way to make it for herself and still be on the right side of it, hopefully as well. Now, 
that's a lot of stuff about George and 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 characters. Uh, it, I know that there there are things that are just in this show that are just flat out enjoyable. And for me, the Tywin Joffrey scene was one of those, especially on a rewatch. You watch it the first time, you're not exactly sure whether Joffrey's going to explode or Tywin's going to explode. So there's a little more tension in it. But now when you see how well Tywin plays Joffrey into realizing that he doesn't really need to know everything, that his hands aren't necessarily having to be tied down by things that Tywin needs to deal with. You know, if Joffrey wants to go kick skulls around in the backyard, fine. But let Tywin do the business of the kingdom. And and you just sit here in your little chair and look pretty, young man. Um, on the other hand, Joffrey brought up a legitimate and now, of course, a true fact. And that is what happens if Danny comes to this kingdom and the dragons are as big as the dragons of old. And that has exactly happened with Drogon. Drogon is huge. I think the directors have said now in season seven, he was supposed to be roughly the size of a 747. Not sure if I got quite that amount of scope out of it, but pretty close. I mean, at least the size of a small plane, right? A DC-9 or something. Yet, Tywin's not worried about it. And you keep thinking about how even Tyrion in the beginning, in season one, was talking about grumpkins and snarks. And Cersei's talking about grumpkins and snarks. None of them seem to be worried about the magical things. They have a grasp on what's in the real world, which is probably a great tribute to some of their success. But the problem is, is that the world is actually changing. And to see Tywin in denial about so many things that are real in the world, like his own daughter and son, like dragons like white walkers um it's the one true drawback that tywin has is that he doesn't have an open enough mind to think about other things now granted this does weigh on tywin a little bit later on in the series before he is killed by Tyrion. um he does talk to oberon martell and he realizes that they do need dorn just as Tyrion had set up that alliance a little bit with the whole marcella thing but they do need Dorne because Dorne's the only people that ever successfully fought dragons. It was the one place that Aegon, you know, and even generations beyond couldn't really do a whole lot with. And you can find some of that in the histories in the Blu-rays. So Tywin is actually trying to appease Oberyn in a lot of ways in order to get help if the dragons do come. Of course, all of that is in the wake of Joffrey's death as well so maybe there were discussions happening behind closed doors that tywin just didn't want joffrey a part of maybe that's the case i'm still on the surface can you believe this now while all of us of course already knew that gendry was a bastard of roberts from season one when ned found him seeing the reveal to gendry in the face of the Red Keep. Now that's something that we haven't had in the books yet. So George gave us a little nugget of how Gidry might react to that. Um, and, and that was, that was pretty cool. And of course, Melisandre is taking Gendry to, as we know, um, to sacrifice him because she says there's great power in King's blood. Um, George actually used a different bastard. Robert had bastards all over the realm, evidently, in the books. Um, but he used a different bastard in here. But, of course, you need to consolidate for TV things. So I didn't have a, a problem with them using Gendry, especially since Gendry kind of fades in and out as far as the books go anyway, especially at this point where he's been separated from Arya because Arya's POV, once you lose Gendry, there's really no need to have Gendry just show up, although he does uh, from time to time. Anyway, point being, I really loved, once again, George giving us just a little bit of an idea as to what would happen if Gendry were to find out that he was a bastard of King Robert. Another thing that happens and i love how george got the opportunity to write this in was weaving the story of why osha really was fleeing south 
in season one. The whole way she met Bran was because she was trying to get away from the thing that had happened to her. And we get that story. And that was told. It was very chilling. Um, I felt bad for Osha in it. You know, really enjoyed that. And I'm glad that George got to put a touch on that character that we really didn't understand up to this point. And one final note on the surface, whenever I make a mistake, I try to call myself out on it as quickly as possible. I had a long rambling statement here before I actually have come to that. But uh, in the last episode, I think it was, where Jojen had his vision about John, I was asking a question, a silly question, about whether he was seeing John with the whites in the future or, or something like that. Obviously, that's not the case because Jojen says here in the present that John is not at Castle Black. All I had to do was look for that one line, and I, I was way too lazy uh, to go looking for it. So, sorry if I wasted your time with a question uh, that you thought that you had an answer to, and then you got to this episode, too, and you realized, oh, Matt, you wasted my time. I apologize for that. That's my stuff on the surface this time around. Let's get to my three big things for this episode. Three, three big things. So the first big thing that I'll touch on is Jamie's vow to Brienne to get the Stark girls back to safety. And he speaks of that debt that he owes. And I think that's just for saving his life, more or less, giving him the will to live. And now things are working out for him. Especially that conversation with him and and. Roos about give the Starks the Lannisters regards and Roos actually uses that line in a couple of episodes so you kind of wonder what does Jamie know about what Tywin and Roos and Walder are all planning at this point he never has admitted that he knew anything about it as far as I know but just kind of really weird that he would do that maybe he genuinely meant it Maybe he meant to give Rob Stark his genuine regards. But on behalf of the family? Hmm. And Roos, of course, used it in the ominous way. Anyway, that's not the point. The point here is between Jamie and Brienne. And because he does feel like he owes this debt to Brienne, he says that he will make sure that Sansa and Arya are returned safely. Because as far as he knows... Both of them are still there in King's Landing. I don't know if he knows anything about Arya at this point. If the Starks don't know anything about Arya, then he doesn't, because Roos would only be subject to telling that information unless Tywin told him to. Another debt that Jamie might owe Brienne is that now, as he does with Kyburn, he's openly admitting to saving people in King's Landing. He was kind of doing that in this kind of half you know, delirious state when he was in the bath, just as a result of everything that had been happening with his hand, I guess, in the, in the heat of the bath or what have you. But with Kyburn, he doesn't have any problem telling people that he was able to save a half a million people. And when he finds out, of course, that Brienne is going to pay a much steeper price because of what he had said about the sapphires it's not really sure whether it's guilt or just a sense of you know i made this mess i'm going to clean it up kind of thing either way you want to look at it he does come back and he faces off with the bear and with Locke to get brienne out of there so that's great but as far as the oath with sansa and Arya goes then once they do get to king's landing sansa of course is already married to Tyrion. And so he's kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Arya is gone. Nobody knows where she is. Everybody in the Lannister family presumes she's dead because she's just a little girl. How could she have gotten very far? Yet nobody has been found, obviously. Uh, No one has been found. Nobody. Bad joke, Matt. Anyway, he's kind of caught in that hard place. But then he does make good on this oath again after Sansa is taken away by Dantos and and Littlefinger after the Purple Wedding. And he's like, Sansa was safe. Now she's possibly not safe. So he once again makes good on his oath to, at that point, a dead woman, which is something that's kind of remarkable about Jamie's character. I mean, 
Brienne is just pure, I swore an oath, I'm going to do it. Whereas Jamie, as we've seen, there are always degrees to everything. But if he jumps on full board, then that makes this scene much more important. And it'd be interesting to see if any of this pays off if Jamie gets to the North. And I suppose there's always a chance that Jamie might be stopped before he gets to the North. It's, it just depends on what Cersei wants, I guess. But it would be interesting to see how Jamie, who is headed straight into the face of the people that he also swore to get home safe, now that they are home safe, how will he look upon this oath now? That's why I made Jamie's vow to Brienne to get the Stark girls to safety one of my big things. Because there's a whole lot of possibilities as to what that means now. My second big thing is in regards to one of those Stark girls, Arya. She gets taken by the Hound. She basically calls out the Brotherhood for what they are. Nothing but criminals themselves. Even if it's in the name of saving lesser folk, as they say. And we root for Beric and Thoros in Season 7 because they're going to help fight against the White Walkers. But there's a lot of debate that can be had about what good, as opposed to bad, the Brotherhood actually did. Because we don't see any of their acts on behalf of the lesser folk. We're only told that that's what they're doing all of this for. For the folks who aren't lords, for the for the small folk. That they're kind of like the army for that. But we never see them do anything on behalf of those people. All we see them do is kidnap and take gold and sell people off. And and so it's not very easy to like the Brotherhood themselves. It's okay to like Beric and Thoros. But I do like the fact that Arya is basically calling what this organization seems to be doing no better than anybody else. Because from her viewpoint, and from our viewpoint as viewers, there's really nothing that we can see that the Brotherhood did all that well. Something else that Arya brings up, and of course this is in tribute to Sirio, but it means something much more to her now, and it's very dark. As she says that her god is the god of death. She doesn't care that the Red God brought Beric Dondarrion back. The Red God won't bring back her dad. So death is still the God for her. And that's important in the way that if you think about what the faceless men do, it does in a lot of ways resemble that. Basically, the faceless men worship a God of death. Although one little quibble that I have here is like Beric Dondarrion refers to the red God as the Lord of Light. Did Jachin Hagar, when he referred to the red God who demanded a sacrifice for the three lives that she saved... Was he referring to the Lord of Light as well? I'm not sure. Or was that just part of the whole Jock and Hagar ruse, the character that he was playing? At any rate, when the Brotherhood is not going to give her to the family that she has left, that's the only reason she's trying to play along. And the only reason that she has any hope, really, is the fact that she needs to get to her family and whether she approves with the methods or not, this brotherhood has promised to get her there. And of course, Rob and Catelyn would pay some kind of ransom. That's what they're banking on. But the only other family that she's had since she lost her father is Hot Pie and Gendry, and they are now not there. And so she has no choice but to strike out on her own. If they're going to go and delay the time where they might miss the wedding completely, how is she ever going to get back to her family? So she takes that opportunity she's given and she takes advantage of it and runs off. And of course she runs right into the arms of the hound. And that's the big thing because the two of them are going to have a lot of adventures. Arya keeps taking on darker and darker father figures. First, her father figure, Ned, was decent. Serio was probably semi-decent, and he was fun. Jock and Hagar, not so decent, willing to kill. And now the Hound, who 
you know, we kind of like the Hound just for the way that he has, is an interesting character. But at the same time, he's he's not like, you know, some clean character. He's got a lot of evil in him in a lot of ways. He's got a lot of hurt feelings that he's converted into an anger that he strikes out against the world with. And because of that, him and Arya actually get along pretty well for quite a while because they both are using their feelings of hurt to strike out with anger. So they go through the rest of this season and season four together. And by the time all of that darkness continues to envelop Arya, she is in a place by the time that he's ready to die that she feels the best way to make him pay for what she feels he's done is to let him suffer. She just takes his money and lets him suffer. That cold stare at the end of season four, it's just chilling. The way she just stares at him as he's trying to goad some kind of emotion out of her to where she'll just go ahead and kill him. And how different would things be if she had? I mean, the Hound was very helpful in the quest to get the Whites to capture one and to hold one captive and, and of course, to manage it when they got to King's Landing with it in Season 7. On the other hand, the Hound and Arya haven't seen each other, and we know that Arya has somewhat forgiven, or at least changed her perspective on the Hound since they last saw each other as well, based on what she was telling the Waif while she was in training with the Faceless Men. So I keep hoping that they're going to run into each other somehow, somewhere, soon, uh, before either of them die. That would be a nice thing to have happen, to see how that reacts. My third big thing is about Danny. And really, this is the only part of the episode where I'm going to talk about Danny, I guess. But she exhibits all of her power over the Yunkai representative that she has available to her. She flaunts her army in front of him. She uses her dragons to intimidate him. And the whole time, Jorah is saying that she doesn't really need Yunkai. But Danny's now on a different kind of mission. She points out that there's 200,000 reasons why she needs to take Yunkai. And it's great to see Danny not give in to the temptation because all she's talked about really before Astapor was getting an army together so that she could go to Westeros and this representative from Yunkai is of course giving her that exact opportunity ships for your men and lots of gold to buy more men I guess if you need to a sellsword army or something like that. That's what Cersei's doing to rev up her numbers. But Danny's on a mission to do things the way that she did in Astapor, and that is to free the slaves and give the slaves a choice to follow her or not. And you have to really admire the way that she handles this Yunkai representative. But her demonstration of intimidation is long remembered by this guy. Who, what was his name? Razdal Mo Eraz, I think is how they said it. Um, I think that's how Masande said it. Anyway, he becomes, of course, one of the principal organizers of the Sons of the Harpy. We see him again in season six in the Battle of the Bastards at Marine, where he thinks he's offering terms to Danny, and she, of course, once again, just totally takes care of him. And, uh, of course, Grey Worm gets to take care of him as well at the end of that. But you can see where he's coming from and not in the way of relaying to what he's coming from. I just mean, but you can understand why he does the Sons of the Harpy thing. Because to him, as he even says to her face, uh, the act at Astapor was a savagery. And he thinks that she's insane. And, of course, he says he has powerful friends, and Danny asks Jorah to find out who that is. Well, we're going to find that out in the very next episode. Um, that is a sellsword army called the Second Sons, and QN Dario Naharis 1.0, coming soon to a 
television screen near you. So a lot of things happening with Danny here that sow seeds for many seasons to come. And with that, I guess I've got a couple of questions as well. Questions. questions. There's a scene in here with Tyrion and Braun where Braun says, you really want to be with Sansa. And of course, Tyrion denies it. But this becomes the point of contention for everybody involved. It's like Tyrion constantly says that he only wants to be with Shay. Fine. Then be with Shay. You know, how is he going to convince anybody else? And do you believe that there's a small part of Tyrion that did want Sansa? Now, I find it interesting that George got to write this particular scene because I think there's a slightly different slant in the books than there is in the television show. And I don't want to get into differences and it's not to criticize one or the other, but I'm just kind of wondering if this scene between Tyrion and Bronn was about George trying to bring in the book side of it in a subtle way. And if that is the case, uh, book readers, and don't look at it from the book perspective, but look at it from the TV perspective. Do you think that Tyrion really wanted Sansa? And do you find it interesting that it's Bronn who says this? And I guess the only person in King's Landing who would know Tyrion better, at least male-wise, would be Jaime. And of course, he's not there. So Bronn would seem to be the guy that would know him best. And he just says the evil thoughts come in for free. Maybe that's a statement about what we should think about whether Tyrion really thinks about Sansa as well. But either way, it's going to be nothing but trouble for him and Shay from here on out. Because Shay's already convinced that she's just become a folly. And the whole chains thing... Was that the last of the Lannister gold? We know that the gold is running out on on the on the Lannisters. And Tyrion maintains that he doesn't want to send Shay away. But he ends up doing so, even if it's just to save her life. But again, this scene is the very beginning of her doubts. Later on in this season, Varys is going to try to send Shay away. And she's going to think that it's Tyrion. And all of this keeps bubbling up until the scene in season four, right before the Purple Wedding, where he does end up sending her away. And he actually uses doing his duty by Sansa and being with Sansa as the reason why he's sending Shay away then. But is there any genuine thought about any of that? And how awkward are these scenes where the three of them are walking around through courts and stuff like with Tyrion and, and Sansa and then Shay just like a footstep back as the handmaiden, but also as the folly for Tyrion. It's just, it's all weird. But help me figure it out. Weigh in on Tyrion and, and Sansa. Did Tyrion really want Sansa in any of that time between now and uh, when she flees at, at the Purple Wedding? I think there was some tenderness there. Not maybe in a love kind of way, but in, at least in a friendship kind of way, especially when you get to the end, when Sansa, it, you know, actually picks up the goblet for Tyrion. She bends down and gets it for him. I mean, despite the fact that his family killed her family, they were actually getting along okay. Right? What a weird situation. Anyway, uh, second question. And this one's a little bit just kind of surfacy and, and kind of funny, just so I can bring up the Joffrey Tywin scene again. But how the heck did Joffrey find out about Danny and the dragons? Who told him? We know that Varys, of course, has that information at his disposal. Hell, he tried to tell Tyrion back in season two. And Tyrion didn't want anything to do with it. So did Varys decide that if Tywin is in denial that he needed to go to Joffrey and tell him about it. I I don't know if it was ever revealed how Joffrey found out about it. And it's not really in any way, shape or form important, but I just, again, it's an excuse to bring that scene up one more time. (laughs) 
I have some other smaller notes, and I call those tidbits. 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 By the way, if you have any questions of your own regarding any episode in Season 3, get those questions in to me by August 25th, 2018, and we'll include them in our feedback podcast. You can submit by sending an email to Matt's audio blog at gmail.com. That's M-A-T-T-S audio blog at gmail.com. Or you can tweet to Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter. Uh, on to my smaller points here, calling them tidbits, of course. I haven't talked about John and Grit, but something that happens here, they talk about discipline in the form of marching. And this whole idea that discipline can overcome numbers is kind of proven true in the ninth episode of season four. And now his watch has ended because the coordination of Ed using the, the scythe and of, of course of Grin being able to motivate his men to fight the giant uh, and everybody being able to hold off the Southern raiding wildling party. It's discipline that more or less does save the day. Now, would it have in the long run? No, I don't think so. Matt's had too many numbers. He just had too much in the way of men. And if he'd had another day before Stannis came in, that wall would have fell. Well, not fallen, but they would have made it through. Here's something else that happens in this episode. And again, there are a lot of things that Michelle McLaren has done wonderfully in this episode. Some kind of sensitive scenes as far as uh, women and nudity. But at the same time, uh, she makes them not be about that. For instance, the Talissa and Rob scene, she's making you concentrate on the fact that they're going to have a kid as opposed to whether they're naked or not. Uh, with the Theon and Miranda, and I can't remember the other girl's name, but with that scene, yeah, there's a little bit of seduction in it, but it's more about... Theon and and how he is finally completely broken and in this scene which has nothing to do with clothes being off but it is about being exposed Ygritte admits to Orel that she loves John and Orel tells her that she won't love him when she finds out what he really is but in the end of course, Tormund tells John that she did still love him. Otherwise, there might not have been a, really a point to this kind of scene, except for the fact that it's another one of those things. And George wrote it, but I wonder how McLaren told Rose Leslie to act this or if she told her anything, because this really is the, the, the kid coming out that she doesn't really want to date, that is trying to say anything he can to get her away from her boyfriend, right? And to see that from Ygritte's perspective about how women have to handle creepers all the time, and you can get back at me if you don't think that Orel was being a creeper. I think he was being a creeper. But regardless of that, uh, you know, another one of those female perspective kind of things. If Vanessa Taylor had written this episode, I would have said, yeah, definitely that's what that scene was really more about than whether Egret admitted to loving John. But since it was George, maybe George just wanted us to know as book readers that Egret actually did love John. And that's kind of important to know as well. Another one of those little George R. Martin touches. At any rate, despite however many arrows she sharpens and how often she says she's going to kill John Snow, um, she's not able to do it in the end. And this scene right here might be the very reason why. I spoke about the, the Theon scene just a second ago, and this is one of the last straws. We know what happens to Theon here. And not unlike Jamie losing his hand and losing his identity through that, we have seen Theon put a lot of his identity to his relationships with women his sexual relationships with women. Um, and, of course, what Ramsey does is cruel and horrific and, and awful. And this is uh, the place where perhaps the, the final turn is made from Theon to becoming Reek. 
one other little note here, and that's about Kyburn um, trying to get his chain. That's the whole reason he's going down there with him, and so he, he's going to keep taking care of Jamie's hand and try and get favor with Tywin to convince the Citadel, I guess, to give him his chain. And they talk about the experiments him and Jamie do. And, of course, the greatest experiment of all, it would seem to be, is Frankensteining the mountain, right? But as far as personal achievement goes for Kyburn, I don't know that he ever really gets a chain. I can't remember the scenes from season six or whatever, if it shows him wearing a maester's chain or not. I'm not sure. But who cares about that? He's basically the hand of the queen. He's one of the most powerful people in Westeros. Um, just a couple short years after just getting there, after being belittled by Jamie here for the experiments that he makes. And he, he talks about how many lives that he saved. He's kind of put in his place by Jamie's half a million. But uh, Kyburn, ultimately, he's still there with Cersei. Jamie is not. So as far as the realm goes in terms of power right now, Kyburn's probably the second most powerful person in the realm. That's a scary thought, is it not? That's going to conclude my talk about the episode. If I missed anything, if there's anything you feel I need to do address more, or if there's anything you disagree with me on, or if you just want to give your own thoughts about things, feel free to send me an email, mattsaudioblog at gmail.com or Matt's G-O-T blog on Twitter. Do so by August 25th, 2018, and we'll include it in our next feedback podcast. That's only, what, next week sometime? So get that in. We've got two more story segments here. Uh, both of them are just fun little segments, little games that we play. The first one is trying to describe the episode in three words. That's next. Three words. Describing the episode in three words. Sometimes you can go meta with your three words. Sometimes you can just do, you know, a nice little summary of an episode in three words. When the stories are this frayed, I have to look for something that uh, helps tie it all together. And for me, this time around, uh, as a book reader now, and I wasn't an up-to-date book reader at the time that this season first aired, but I am now watching it around this time. I hadn't started A Storm of Swords yet because I was trying to stay spoiler-free for the TV. And then uh, when I read A Storm of Swords between seasons three and four, I realized, oh, wait a minute. They're doing seasons three and four is all of the one book. And from thenceforth, I was spoiled. Anyway, uh, I tr did my best when I was on Podcast Winterfell to keep that from people. Sometimes I lied rather badly to try and keep what I knew from people. But regardless of that, this three words comes from a book reader perspective. And that is book gaps filled. And I think it's important to realize that maybe George R. R. Martin in some ways because as time has gone on, um, the books and the television show have separated more and more and more. And maybe in the writing of this episode, George was trying to just throw in little nuggets that were from the books to keep it more authentic to the characters the way he had them, as opposed to the way uh, Dan and Dave had kind of started to shape them. And whichever side of the debate as to which is correct doesn't really matter. They're George's characters. So he can do with them whatever he wants in his books. He's given license for Dave and Dan to do whatever they want in the show. That's important to remember. And even though maybe there's just these little bits of nuggets in here um, that might help you think how the television show is affecting the books or how the books are affecting the television show, um, it's just important to realize that Everybody's got permission here to do whatever they want. And so you can't criticize it really one way or the other as far as I'm concerned. You could come up with another set of three words too, like Michelle McLaren rocks. Um, the way she handled some of those sensitive nudity scenes with some principal actors, Richard Madden, Una Chaplin, uh, Charlotte Hope, who will become a bigger character in Miranda in seasons five and six. Actually, seasons four, five, and six. So, uh, you know, she handled all of that to where that really wasn't the issue. 
I mean, even with the whole Theon thing, you were just wondering when Ramsay was going to show up, right? That was the thing that was most prevailing on your mind, not about whether you saw someone's butt or not, or at least that's what was most prevailing on my mind. Maybe I'm strange. Well, I know that I'm strange, but maybe I'm stranger than I thought I was. Let me just put it that way. Uh, (laughs) What would your three words be for this particular episode? You can send yours via email or Twitter, and I won't bother you with the addresses again. I will bother you with this. If you're listening to this podcast in its audio form on most podcast apps, you're probably hearing music underneath this. Please look in the show notes and at least acknowledge the name of the artist that's performing this music. It's very important to me to pass on the love, being a a person who's toured and understands what it's like just to get your name recognized uh, in terms of a musical product. It's very important to recognize the people who are making this stuff. Ramin Javadi, obviously, I'm going to be doing a whole segment on his music coming up here in just another segment from here. But uh, yeah, Mr. Pizzarelli uh, deserves your love. I'm not saying he deserves your money. Let me make that perfectly clear. This may not even be your thing. You may hate this music, but I'd appreciate it if you just at least remember his name. Uh, look in the show notes. Look in the show notes for the guy who's provided the drum loop for the music that I created for the beginning and ending bumpers and those kinds of things. Very important to me personally that you look in the show notes and just go, oh yeah, that guy. That's what I'm looking for. Not that you buy any of their stuff. Just go, oh yeah, that guy. I'll be back with the best coupling of the episode. That is what we call the brothel mates that's next. Brothel mates of the episode. The best coupling of the episode. The best coupling of the episode is sometimes hard to come up with. Sometimes it's very easy to come up with because you have a lot of possibilities. You don't have to just pick two people. I did pick two people this time around, but uh, regardless of that, You could pick a person and a concept or a person and, uh, I don't know, an object of some kind. Um, I wouldn't pick the third walnut on the second tree and the second walnut on the third tree uh, if I were you. But you could pick just about anything else if you wish because I don't know exactly how walnuts do their thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Anyway, Rob and Talissa are my brothel mates of this particular episode. Uh, they're the best coupling in this because not only is it just a magical moment showing their love before or Rob gets the news about Talissa being pregnant, but in the sharing of the news, the way that Talissa reveals it, the way that Rob is overwhelmed by it, uh, that all was just so beautiful to me. I've never been married. I don't have any kids. I'll probably never ever experienced that kind of a thing either in a better way or in a worse way um and i'm perfectly cool with that but uh it just seemed like the the absolute capping moment and the thing that lifted rob's spirits to the point where he could go ahead and go through and look forward to the fact that he was going to get Walder Frey's army and he was going to be able to feel safe again. He was going to get his sister's home. Everything was going to be okay. Now he had a son to do all of this for, or so he thought a son or a girl or one of each. Don't get greedy, Rob. Anyway, my point being is that he, you know, this is, this is the fuel that he needed to where he started to feel okay to apologize to Walder and look what it got him. It's so sad. That's on a, on a rewatch, you know, this was a cool scene when we were watching season three and we were TV only viewers and we didn't know what was going to happen. There were whispers on Twitter about some kind of red wedding. We had no idea what that was. And then two episodes from now, you watch this scene and not only does it warm your heart, but it also breaks your heart. Um, Just a wonderful, truly beautiful couple right here, and their lives are about to be destroyed. It's so sad. Well, I bummed myself out. But there was a nice version of Robin Talissa's theme played right before she revealed the whole news 
about the baby to Rob. Um, that is not one of the themes that we're going to be covering in this episode particular episode in my next musical segment i will tell you this there were at least nine cues that i counted that were themes of stuff that we already knew i had already talked about so instead of searching frantically through a bunch of incidental music for something that might become a theme later on I decided I've been talking to you about music for a while. It's time for a test. That's next. An analysis of the music in HBO's Game of Thrones. There. Your father's house. As Melisandre reveals to Gendry about his true lineage, this is definitely a theme that we've already heard before, and we've even analyzed it here on this podcast before, but there are a heck of a lot of themes in this episode that we've already covered. Many, many more, let's say per capita, than a usual episode. Nine different themes used in this particular episode, at least, and... I know that I often kid you guys that I don't give tests in the musical section uh, in regards to terms, but let's have some fun. Let's see if we can identify seven of these nine themes just by listening to them. And as a hint, as I told you in the Brothel Mates, we will not be playing anything from the Rob and Talissa theme. We have covered that. And I'll give you a bonus we're not going to be playing anything from any of the Danny scenes. So, you know this theme that we just started. I'm sure you do. It actually first appeared in the very pilot of Game of Thrones. This theme. Do you remember the name? Well, maybe or maybe not, but I'm betting that you have heard that melody in your head before. It's what is called The King's Arrival in the Season 1 soundtrack, and it's from when Robert first arrived in Winterfell. And we've heard various incarnations of this theme sounding anywhere from tender, like when Joffrey gave Sansa the necklace, to evil, like at the end of Season 2, Episode 1. All different kinds of versions, and here we have this version that you just heard. And if you guessed right, congratulations. If you didn't, obviously no sweat. It's not like I'm actually keeping score. But let's try another theme from this episode. I owe you a debt. Goodbye, Sir Jamie. This one we've associated with Brienne a lot, but it actually was first introduced in season one, and one of the first versions of it was during the scene when Ned and Kat were saying goodbye in King's Landing. The last time they would ever say goodbye, we heard this theme. And actually that clip may have seemed a little long because the theme doesn't really seem to kick in for a while. Yet there is a motive from that theme, a small part of that theme that is present the whole time. 
The difference is, is that we're used to having it go in big jumps as far as this theme goes. But because Ramin changes the octave of the last two notes of that first part of the sequence, like this, it actually seems different. But lo and behold, it's not, because you're going to hear those same two notes in that sequence an octave lower when you're able to recognize the music as something that you've heard before, like this. Now, I've been stalling for you so that you could think of the name of this theme. Do you remember? On the Season 2 official soundtrack, it's called The Old Gods and the New. Now, you might actually, if you've listened to the podcast, hear me refer to it more as the honor theme. Either answer is acceptable. And actually, this theme made more than one appearance in this particular episode. One of the best versions that's actually out there of this theme is when Jamie realizes that his sapphire trick to save Brienne's life might actually be the reason that she loses her life. And the chords underneath are kind of changed to make it sound more conflicted. So you'll hear the same melody, but different harmonies underneath. Let's listen to that. Make fools to kill her. These men have been at war a long time. Most of them will be dead by winter. So once again, either call it the honor theme or the old gods and the new, whatever you want to call it. What's your score so far? Are you two for two? Oh, for two? Not really any worries. It's not like I'm keeping score, but I hope that you are. Let's try another one. This one will probably be pretty easy for you. <sighs> Like I said, this one's pretty easy. Unless you associate the arpeggiated chords, meaning a, a chord, a harmony that is played in individual notes that go along with it, like this. And sometimes those kind of arpeggiated chords are actually just used on their own by themselves. But equally, the melody has been used on its own as well. And we first started hearing it in season two on Pike. Hint, hint. You got it, right? What is dead may never die from the season two soundtrack. Or if you wish, you can just call it the Greyjoy theme. And here, the solo melody kind of helped to make you feel Theon's isolation and his lack of power. He didn't have the rolling seas underneath him. No need to discuss it any further than that, right? So are you three for three? Doesn't matter. I'm not taking grades. Let's try another one. Big hint, I just covered this one in last Thursday's episode of the podcast. If you attack the wall, you'll die. All of you.
No need to play or explain that one, I hope. The melody's pretty present. And that was, of course, John and Egret's theme, You Know Nothing. And that's from the Season 3 official soundtrack. Let's move on to another one. Hope you're keeping score. This one might sneak in on you, but I think you'll hear it. He came in through the back of the hood. Only it wasn't Bruni. Not really. His skin was... I promise your maester I'd get you to Castle Black and no further. Like I said, this one might sneak in on you because Ramin actually doesn't start with it. Instead, he starts with this other little kind of motive that's going on that's really more about Osha herself, like this. But then when she's talking about her man that turned into a white, you definitely hear the theme that I'm looking for as the right answer. This one. That's right. It's the theme for the White Walkers. We heard it in the very pilot episode of this series. And it's present a lot of times when people are just talking about the North or when people are talking about white walkers or whites or what have you. That's five themes so far. I hope my music analysis has helped you to know all of them, but I'll be happy to take some of the blame also, if not. Let's move on to number six right here. When my father sees me, the first thing he's going to ask is what happened to my hat? And I'm going to tell him this man chopped it off. I had no I could tell him. This man saved my life. We return to Harrenhal. Now. That's another one that we've very recently covered. The key to identifying it is actually the three note little snippet that's kind of lodged in there. This one. It's a theme for Jamie and maybe you could say Jamie and Brienne and that works here too. After all, he's going back to Hall to save her. But even I got thrown off just a little bit by this one for just a second because Ramin did this really neat trick. He actually took the ending of what we heard the last time and he put that at the beginning. But if you said anything like Jamie's bath speech or anything like that, you got it right. And it's called Kingslayer on the season three soundtrack. Only one more theme left out of the seven. We've done six. I hope you're still keeping your own score. The final one, you're actually going to get for free. It's like a pass that I'm giving you. It's the Reigns of Castamere. And this time around, it's done with some brass in order to give it a little bit of a harsher tone to kind of match up with the bear's roar, I guess. And I'm wondering what your final score would be. Yeah, I know you got one of them, right? Because I just told you the answer and we haven't even heard it yet. I hope you did well. Here's the clip, and I'll be back with some closing thoughts in just a minute. Well, we must be on our way. Yes. 
Sorry about the sapphires. Thanks for joining me. Next time around, we're looking at Season 3, Episode 8, Second Sons. Don't forget, August 25th, 2018 is your deadline for the next feedback podcast. Matt's audio blog at gmail.com. Matt's GOT blog on Twitter. If you have any thoughts about any of my thoughts or about the episodes themselves, feel free to share. And I'll talk to you on Thursday. See ya.